we go. All right, so let's just open it with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, thank you for the opportunity to stand here and to give testimony of you uh, in my life. Lord, I, I pray that none of this would gain um, my glory, but it would be to you. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, open uh, our ears and our heart, hearts and um, to how you are at work in this uh, world today. And Lord, we just pray, Lord Jesus, come, come quickly. In your son's name we pray, amen. So I stand up before you here to confess that I am broken. I am a work in progress. And if I in any way um, convey that I've arrived, that's false. And so with that in mind, I wanted to give my testimony this morning. I've done it before. Um, I will have been here at Northgate 30 years um, coming up quickly. Um, I am now old. Um, <laughs> I don't feel old. Uh, but uh, I, I, so some of you have heard this before. Uh, and this will be new to others. Uh, but what I want to focus on is in the last seven years of my life. But in order to do that, I got to give you the short version of, oh, wait, I'm doing this. The short version of how and when I was saved. I was saved at 15. Um, and at a uh, Christian uh, music concert in Kentucky called Ichthus. But how did I get there? Well, um, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My mom grew up in urban um, Philly, and my dad um, was first generation uh, here from Ireland, and he grew up in uh, the Bronx. And so uh, they grew up in very Catholic communities. So your family, your church, your neighbors, pretty much all one and the same. Um, that was how I was raised for the first six years of my life, because I grew up in a very similar environment. My dad worked for Kodak, he got promoted and they moved him to Kodak office. So we moved here um, when I was six years old in the middle of the uh, blizzard of 76. I remember the snow over my head. Um, I thought it was great. Um, so then we started going to St. Pius X in Chai Lai. I, that's where I went to school, grammar school. When I went to high school, I went to Aquinas. So we went to church every Sunday, Catholic mass. I had to go to confession um, more than most. Um, not because, well, that didn't sound right, but my parents made me, okay, let's just put it that way. This is what she did. Um, so, you know, it's a, a very matriarchal um, Irish Catholic family, which is not uncommon. Um, and I didn't know any better. I didn't know any different. Uh, I would say, looking back, I was a very spiritually sensitive young man, all the way to, you know, the, the earliest memories that I have. I felt things deeply. I always did. Um, and as I was being taught and raised in the Catholic Church, um, we were taught that we were sinners, and I felt that very deeply. And if you wanted to deal with that sin, you went through the sacraments, and uh, to have that relationship with God, you had um, the, the, the church, and the priest in particular was your mediator. So uh, it, that's where you would have to go to confession, and, and uh, as you get confessed your sins, you were forgiven. And there's a lot that goes into all of this, but my point being is not to explain it to you, is to say this is how I was raised and I knew no different. Now, um, in my neighborhood, there was, uh, we were about half Catholic and we all kind of went to the same church, but the, the, the family right next door went to Pierce Memorial. So they're Protestant, I was the Protestant kid, he, uh, or I was the Catholic kid, he was the Protestant kid. We became best friends and we just hung out together. We didn't talk about church. We didn't talk about religion. We didn't do anything. We just hung out, had a great time. We're still friends today, you know. Uh, and uh, But as we grew up together, he had a testimony to me. And uh, he would come back from church and say things once in a while. I didn't give it a second thought. Uh, but then as we uh, grew older and we got to be interested in girls, uh, he would go off to um, like summer camp and um, uh, youth group and things along those lines, but if you raise Catholic, you don't do that because you went to school with them anyways. So why would you have a youth group? You, the, that would just be the basketball team or you know your, your CED class or whatever it would, would be. So uh, as our world started colliding more and more, he would invite me and I would go for the girls. And then that's why I went to this music concert. I didn't know Christian music. Um, I knew none of the songs. I had no reason to go. Um, other than 
the girls, you girls. So had a great weekend. Didn't know any of the songs, didn't understand any of it, got a really good sunburn because it was Kentucky. Um, and uh, in one of the, uh, I can remember the, the, the second night, I must have missed it the first time, but the second night uh, in between sets, uh, they had a guy come up and he shared the gospel. That was the first time I had ever heard the gospel, ever, never once before. And I was like, that's it. That is what I'm missing. So I stood up and um, I'm looking at my friend, you stand up. He goes, I'm already saved, Jim. <laughs> so I go up and, and, you know, I have no memory after that. Nothing made sense. You know, they talked to me. I went to the tent. The tent. They gave me a Bible. I had, uh, you know, counseling for probably 30 minutes and I was told to go to a local church. Well, you go home. Your mom's not letting you go to a local church. Let me tell you that. So, you know, I got my friend next door, who's he and I are probably about the same age spiritually. Uh, he may be just a little bit more. I had this Bible. The only way I knew how to read it is you open it up and you read what you're looking at. Not a great way to read the Bible, let me tell you. Um, and I was going to Catholic school at this point. Obviously, I was a sophomore in high school, um, and I had all of those pressures as well. Um, so I did not really grow from the age of 15 until my early 20s. And that in and of itself is a different story. I'm going to leave that um, for another time, or if you want to talk, we can talk about it. But what I want to focus on is the last seven years of my life. And I can't do that unless I explain to you first and foremost that I am saved. And when I started coming to Northgate, um, after Michelle and I were married, which is we're, next year we're married 30 years, which how I know I've been here 30 years, um, I, uh, my father-in-law gave me a study Bible. It was a NASB, New American Standard. And uh, praise the Lord, he started pouring himself into me. He was teaching me. Trust me, when I was dating his daughter, he hated me. And then <laughs> when I was in son-in-law and I gave him his first grandchild, he turned to like me, but he was investing in me. And I knew I had to memorize verses. That's not how my mind works. I struggle with it even to this day. But I remember sitting in a Bible study on uh, the book of James, and this verse just really jumped out at me. So this is the first verse I ever memorized in the NASB. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that testing your faith produces endurance. It's probably the best verse I know. I've memorized verses many, many times in the past, but none of them stick. I got to repeat it more, I know. But um, this one meant something to me. And the reason it did is because I was going through trials in my life. And those trials have never stopped. They've changed, they're different, but they've continued. Um, and I, I knew that my faith was being tested and I wanted that endurance. I stand before you now to testify that the Lord has given me endurance. But what I do not have not had was joy. I didn't have it. I suffered every step of the way. Now, about 15 years ago, uh, at family camp, the, uh, uh, one of the speakers there um, was going through Psalm 139. And uh, the last two verses there um, uh, really stuck with me. And I, I've, been, I've taught them here before. I've talked about them a lot. Um, with the advent of online Bibles, I switch versions a lot. Uh, um, and this one I really like in NIV. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's very interesting now that we're, uh, as an assembly, uh, memorizing that verse. It's talking about anxiety, isn't it? And I would not tell, call myself an anxious person. I tend to go with the flow. But it really depends on how you define anxiety. Anxiety is just those, those negative thoughts, those difficulties, that, the, 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 the negativity in my life that's between my ears. And this verse really struck me is because, uh, you know, I'm asking God to search my heart. I'm asking him to test me, to know these bad thoughts that are in me, because they're there. And then when I find that offensiveness, when I, I that wickedness that's in me, Lead me out of it. Lead me to the everlasting way. And that's when I started realizing how important my thought life is. And I would understand thought life in the sense that, um, you know, you want to, you know, garbage in, garbage out. But it's really more than that. 
the, uh, the, the, the psalm that talks about as a man thinketh really got my attention as well. Really, the, the, it, the concept is, is that the way you think impacts your emotions. Because not all, everything you think is right. Not everything you read is right. Not everything you see is right. But once it gets in there, it impacts your emotions, which then impacts your actions, which then impacts your habits, and that's your character. And it all starts right there between your ears. I won't say that I've had victory in that, but I do understand it more than I ever have in the past. And the last one, in the last couple of years, this one uh, has led me to meditation. Psalm 4610a, be still and know that I am God. In the, um, over COVID, I, I did a lot of walking. And I'm going to talk about this more later, but I want to explain to how I use this verse. And I, uh, I started using this as a mantra. I would go on my walk. I've got nothing. I'm not listening to anything. Um, I've been on this walk a thousand times, so I can turn my brain off. And I'm, it's not like I'm enjoying nature. But as I was going through this, I realized that this verse here, you can actually take it apart and do it word, word by word. So if just start with be, just be present, be here, be, be still. I couldn't do it. I can't do it still. I got to walk. Now you get me in front of a beach or, you know, a beautiful sunset. I got to go to the Rocky Mountains last year. Wow. I can be still there. But you walk around my neighborhood or you go anywhere in my house. I can't. I'm not there yet. Be still and know. Know what? Just know. Think. Be aware. Be still and know that I am the great I am. Be still and know that I am God. You do it word by word, it doesn't change the meaning, but man, it takes it deep. That impacted me on those walks. So, based on those three verses, or their passages, because there's probably five verses there, um, I want to talk about the last seven years, and I apologize for those that don't know me. Uh, this is a fair amount of history. The people here uh, that come on a regular basis know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but I want to start in 2014. In March of 2014, I became unemployed in um, a very quick and effective sort of way. I had no uh, severance package. I wasn't really expecting it. And I will, uh, I want to confess to you that led to an identity crisis that continues to this moment right now. That changed me in ways that I really can't explain. And it's just so deep down. Then in um, 2017, well, between 2014 and 2017, I was unemployed for three months. I had to change careers. I had to start over. I got a job. Uh, the Lord was very good and very gracious in, to me. But my identity, inside, I was broken. And um, I ended up uh, in a decent job. Um, I, you know, I didn't get any debt. I didn't really have to go backwards too much. Um, and then I decided to go back to school. And the Lord was really good this morning. Because uh, Rich and Beth had to go to that school, Roberts Wesleyan. And there's a picture of me on the wall. <laughs> Sorry. I did not expect this. They took a picture of it and showed it to me this morning. But uh, this is where my restart began. I went back and got my master's in strategic leadership. Um, and while I was there, I, uh, I met a guy by the name of Dr. John Walker. I heard it said that when um, the student is ready, the, the teacher arrives, and he was mine. And, um, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But so I now am uh, finishing in, in, in 17, and in 19, I turned 50. I didn't take that well. I didn't take that well at all. I tried to reframe it. I tried to call it my year of jubilee. You know, <laughs> I tried hard. It didn't work. 
I looked back and I felt like a failure. And, I'm sorry. In my mind, I was a failure. So, going back to my background in Catholicism, so yeah, or that led, that led to stress because I had to fix my past mistakes. And as you know, from 2017 to 2020, as an elder here at Northgate, we went through a lot. I did not walk away unscathed. Sorry, COVID became rest for me. I got to find out what true biblical rest means. I decided to step down as an elder because I was reflecting and I was resetting. It was the right decision. And I want to talk about why that was the right decision and, and what that means for me next. And then in... Um, I gotta move. Then in uh, 2021, this year, what I wanted to talk about, and I moved the slides around, so this is a little out of order here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to define my last seven years as wrestling with God and look at how Jacob wrestled with God. My wrestling is over. And um, I've got the limp. It's not physical, um, but it, uh, I do have the limp. And I walked away with the blessing, though, as well. And I want to talk about that. Uh, so let's look at Genesis chapter 23 together. So if you remember this story, this is uh, Jacob is going to uh, see Esau for the first time in quite a while. And um, this doesn't, there we go. I got to reboot this. So uh, I think in verses six and seven in, in uh, Genesis chapter 23, um, you, you can see there. Um, then the messenger returned to Jacob saying, we come to your brother Esau and he also is coming to meet you with uh, and 400 men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. So he divided the people who were there and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. He's sending them away. He's dividing in case, in case Esau is coming to destroy him. And we don't know why that's going to happen because he stole his birthright. And then you get down to uh, before they meet in the next chapter in verse 23. So uh, Jacob is going off by himself and he rose that night and took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent them over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joints. And he's wrestled with him, and he said, let, let me go, for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob uh, asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask me about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peral, for I have seen God's face to face and my life is preserved. He Just as he crossed over to Pernol, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. And while I am not calling myself Jacob by any stretch of the imagination, um, I, I, I do feel as if I can relate to uh, what he has gone, gone through there. So wrestling with God. Notice here in verse... Uh, 24, then Jacob was left alone, and then the second part, and a man wrestling with him until the break of day. Jacob did not initiate that wrestling. God did. He went after him, and he went after him hard. If I was Jacob, I would have gone alone so I could find some solace, because my, my brother, who has every right to be mad at me, is coming at me with 400 men, small army. 
I'm, I'm, I'm praying to God. I'm looking for comfort. Instead, <laughs> it's, a, it's a battle all night long. And by doing that, God in his infinite wisdom is fo- forcing Jacob to focus on him as God. And while I have not been struggling with God physically, I have been asking him hard questions, and I don't have the answers. And a lot of them, I still don't have the answers. But the tenacious faith leads to blessings and peace. If you go on in the story to the next chapter, the the relationship between Jacob and Esau is not what Jacob expected. There was transformation. He walked away with the limp. And the interesting thing about that is a limp is the weakened body, but his faith was stronger. He was not the same man the next day. He couldn't go to his brother and, and, and in any way act as if he could fight. He, he was on a bum, bum leg. The only thing he had to do was go with faith that God would protect him. So if I'm anything like Jacob, and if his name means deceiver, I'm not here to deceive you or my wife or anybody else. I was deceiving myself. And in transformation, I want to be one that strives with God. And that's why I said, I'm broken. I'm a work in progress. I'm not there yet. But isn't it really about the the journey here? Because the destination is eternity with God. And this is where, where Dr. Walker comes in. So during uh, school, he was my, one of my first professors. Um, we, we, we had a really good relationship. Um, and after graduation, we started meeting on a, a monthly basis. He was helping with my career, but we would always talk um, uh, spiritual things. So he's this large black man. He's older than me, and I'm this large white man. Um, and uh, he, he has been a, such a tremendous blessing in my life. And uh, one of the things he, he would do all the time when we would pray together, he would pray something similar to this, Lord, bless what Jim's hands touches. And the way I was spiritually raised here at Northgate, that made me very uncomfortable. I can't explain to you why. I didn't like it. I never asked him about it. We continued, uh, and he would pray it every time. And over time, the Lord really made it clear to me what he meant. John chapter 13 is one of my favorite books in the uh, chapters in the Bible. And that's the story of Jesus taking the basin and the towel and washing the disciples' feet, including Judas, including Peter. And yet at the end of it, there's this phrase that Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are if you do them. That's the blessing he was talking about. If I know the word of God and I'm doing it, the Lord is going to bless me. Maybe not the way I want to be blessed, but he's certainly going to bless me. And so now we've adopted it as a family. We would pray together that the Lord would bless what our hand touches. We we, we pray it for our children. We pray it for you. We pray it all the time. It's quite a testimony in in a short uh, phrase there. And because he was helping with my career uh, and my second career, or well, actually if I had my third, I'm going to my fourth right now, um, I was going to become a pro- I was becoming a project manager. So I've got a plan for everything, right? I got a plan at home. I got a plan at work. I got a plan uh, at Northgate. I, I've got all these plans. And he kept asking me the same question all the time. Did you pray your plan? Well, no. Why not? Let's pray it now. And that's a completely different message altogether. But in, in project management, it's an iterative process. Your plan at the beginning is never the one at the end, because if you don't adjust, you're, you, uh, you're going to miss the mark. But in the same way, that th- that's a biblical concept. We make our plans, but the Lord directs our path. It's an iterative process, and we need to be doing that, and, and he taught me that. And you notice that he's changing the way I'm thinking. And the last one is he encouraged me to read the book, Watch, Watchmanese book, The Spiritual Man. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like that big. It's three volumes. I kept finding reasons not to read it. Um, I finally made my way through it. And my recommendation, if you're interested, you do it all at once as fast as you can. Because um, there's so much there. 
but it's a very complex look at the workings of the human spirit, soul, and body. This, this uh, brother has quite a testimony from the 1920s. He grew up in communist China. He was saved and then just dove into scripture and then wrote this book. So there was no one really influencing other than God himself. Not, not everything in there, I would say, is uh, I would agree with. But he made me think in ways that I had never thought before. That I am a spiritual being. That I have a, a soul and that uh, my body are three distinct circles that over, overlap each other. So from that, uh, I keep trying to do it here. I want to talk about what this looks for me limping forward. Where do I go from here? What's next? Well, I got to answer two very important questions, and you do too. The first, the first most important question in the world is who is God? And that's why I started with my testimony. That is who God is to me. God is my Savior. Only you can answer that question for yourself. Are you saved? Have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? The second most important question in the world, and this is where I fail, is who am I? Now, because of uh, my Catholic upbringing, I, I, I really struggle, and it, it bore itself out in my identity crisis. And I'm not looking to in any way blame. This is just who I am as a person, that I know the source. Now, let's start with the solution first. If we look at first, or Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, what I want to go through this very quickly is this, this is who I am. This is my identity, because I'm a Christian. So that means in Christ, I am blessed, I am chosen, I am holy, I am adopted, I am accepted, I am redeemed, I am an heir of God, and I am sealed. That is who I am. That is my identity. Now, if I'm thinking like that, everything's different. I wasn't. I haven't been. So if I put Psalm 139, verses 23, into, into practice here, remember that says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Going to those anxious thoughts. If I start replacing the, that negativity with a positive view of gospel-like, grace-like concepts, and I use God's words to describe myself, then God's grace becomes part of my identity, and then the more grace-like my life is filled. This is Christianity 101, and I missed it. This is hard stuff. This is stuff that you have to do on a regular basis. This is what um, it means by capturing every thought and comparing it to Scripture. I have to think in gospel terms. That is the only way that I can deal with my identity crisis. To deal with my failure, this is a little bit harder for me. I am my own worst critic. I am not an encourager. I know you're shocked, sorry. I am an exhorter. Um, and I'll, I'll use Michelle as an example. She didn't. Um, she loves to be encouraged. I struggle with it, but I love Michelle so much that I am willing to treat her as I treat myself. Yep, you caught it. So if I'm my own worst critic for myself, I am for her as well, just because she had the misfortune of marrying me. That's not good. It's not good at all. I have a negative self-image, and I am on a perpetual guilt trip. There is nothing you can say critical about me that I haven't said 10 times worse. I have this ongoing dialogue in my head. I should have done better. I could have done better. I, I, I am a closet perfectionist, and I beat myself up continually. Now, I don't want you to beat me up, but I'm okay if I do it to myself. You think of the golden rule, right? And so often will people say, well, that's not, you know, isn't, you know, do unto others, you have them do unto you. We should go with the platinum rule, right? That, you know, that bugs, bugs me a lot. Because if you stop and think about the golden rule, I don't want anybody to do unto me as they're doing to themselves. What I want you to do is I want you to listen to me so well, you know what I need, and then give me that. 
That's the golden rule. But how can you do that when you're your own worst critic? You can't. Because the only thing you're in your head is becomes very selfish. But if I put James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 together, this is where the joy comes in. I can consider it all joy. And why is that? Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into it, but if you think of uh, Daniel chapter 3, we got, uh, and I, I blame um, uh, VeggieTales for this, I have to call them Rack Shack and Benny. Um, <clears throat> when Meshach, well, I'm not even going to try. So anyways, um, when they get thrown into the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar sees, sees four instead of three, and calls them out, they come out without even smelling of smoke because God put Jesus in there with them. And what I had to realize is that God doesn't always intervene. He has not intervened in a lot of the situations in my life. But he's always there with me. And if I think that way, how can I not have joy? But the only way that's going to happen is if I change the way that I think. And that's hard for me. So dealing with my stress, this comes to my priorities, and they, they have been wrong, and I, I, I'm not um, uncommon. I think this is true of most people. In, in today's world, it's a badge of honor to be busy. Busyness is a decision. It's a decision I am trying to unmake every day of my life. I have... Uh, reviewed and, and go back to the serenity prayer very often because this is how I was raised. I was raised to con try to control what you can't control. And that is where the anxiety comes from. But if I get very clear on what I can control and what I cannot, and I focus on what I can control, things start to change. We live in a life of distractions right now. They, our, our cell phones, Netflix, social media, TV, um, books. I, it, it's almost impossible to uh, get away from it unless it's a conscious decision. Those decisions, the, the, those distractions means you don't have to think. And if you don't have to think, the priorities can get in the way and the busyness and the world creeps in. And before you know it, your priorities are misaligned. And this fast-paced life really starts, uh, the way that Satan is at work today is brilliant. He is attacking us in ways that we aren't really equipped to protect ourselves. Unless we go back to Scripture. So putting uh, Psalm 46, 10a into uh, action. Have you ever tried to just be silent with God? Just sit there. Don't do anything, don't say anything, no phone, no TV. And just be you and God. If you know how to do it, can we talk? And I don't mean that flippantly or, or funny. I'm struggling with it. I've been talking to Michelle for a while. I want to find a cabin that I can go to. I'm just struggling finding it. Where all I can do is sit. You know, do nothing. And just sit. I can do it if I walk. I can do it in short bursts. But I, I, this is why I say I'm broken. If you truly do this, be still and know that I am God. You cannot know that he is God and not exalt him. And if you're going to exalt him, why wouldn't you be surrendering to him? And if you're going to dwell with him, then it should get easier and easier to be sitting silently with him. And that gives you the opportunity to take refuge with him. You can gain strength from him. And if I think about God this way, my priorities align, I rest appropriately, and this modern stress goes away. And one of the things that I was going to talk about, but I decided not to, was this idea of biblical rest. God created the Sabbath, and I don't honor it. 
I, I want to get to the point where I can take one day off and do nothing. Not for the purpose of doing nothing. Not so I can watch TV or, uh, or read a book or uh, do whatever I want, but just to truly rest. I know people that work seven days a week, and I don't think they've struggled as much as I have in the last seven years. I, I, for some reason, that I just have not been able to rest, and COVID changed that for me. I was able to understand what that truly means to reflect on that and try to reset and that was one of the reasons I had to step down. My goal is to deal with my identity crisis, my, um, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my uh, failure and my, my stress. And, I, and for, for the most part, I have. And that's why I say this is an ongoing process. And uh, what I want to be able to do moving forward is do the work of an elder just without the title. I want to sit in a pew and be a, a, a model Christianity as God is showing it to me. I want to serve. I want to be useful for God. And I know I can't do that unless I take care of myself first. So as we close here, I found this quote from Tim Keller that I really like. And he says it better than I can. God sees us as we are, loves us as we are, and accepts us as we are. But by his grace, he does not leave us as we are. He's continuing to work on us every single day. And that's why I feel in my life, in the last seven years, I wish it was only a night, but it was seven long years of wrestling with God. As I walk away with this limp, um, I, I want to give him the glory and thank him for his blessings. The Lord in the, the last uh, year or so has blessed me in ways that I am embarrassed to, to talk about, to be honest with you. I, I couldn't anticipate them. And uh, it has nothing to do with me. It's just him preparing me along the way. And I am internally grateful for what the Lord has been doing in my life. And I, I pray and, and would encourage you to seek him out so that he would uh, be doing the same in yours. Let's just close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, that you are alive and at work. And when it even seems as if you're silent, you're still uh, having an impact on our lives. So, Lord, I just pray for each one of us today that not only would we accept you as Lord and Savior, for anybody that's hearing this or in this room right now, but also, Lord, that we would continue to work for your good and your glory, not for the blessings in and of themselves, but how you would gain the glory in that. And we look forward to that time in eternity when we can take these crowns and lay them at your feet. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen.